Hey, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, great to be here. Uh, my name is Tom Trowbridge. I'm speaking about uh, Fluence, but really about, first, about the need for Web3 storage payments and compute. But first, I want to thank the IPFS community, the Filecoin community, Juan in particular, but everybody for having us and partnering with us. It's a terrific ecosystem to be a part of. We think that there's nothing more important than um, storage as one of the foundational kind of critical components of Web3. And so I'm going to talk about two other components, obviously, um, particularly compute. But without storage, none of this happens, none of this works. So I'm thrilled to see this group here and for us to be a part of this community. So my name is Tom Trowbridge. I'm co-founder of Fluence Labs. I helped put together Hedera Hashgraph earlier um, and have been in this space for a while. Um, look forward to kind of digging into this a little bit. And I'm going to start off by talking higher level about kind of big tech and censorship and then going to go into a bit more about how compute is a critical piece of the Web3 ecosystem and in, in conjunction with storage and payments. And then from there, a little bit more detail about how that compute actually works and how Fluence architecture is a complement to storage and how it actually works and can create a powerful ecosystem. So first, in terms of censorship, you know, big tech is really becoming an arm of governments. And that shouldn't be super surprising because every single industry, the larger it gets, governments have to interact with it and those businesses need to interact with governments. And so you can see um, governments coming down really hard, particularly in, you know, there's lots of examples in Russia censoring Google, censoring YouTube, that you sort of expect from totalitarian governments, right? That has happened in China. This is not new. You've seen it in a variety of other, other markets as well. But you don't pay as much attention to it until recently that censorship not being just driven by Italian governments, but also by democracies. India was one of the first examples where this was really clear, where the Indian government forced WhatsApp to de-platform effectively opposition politicians and actually stop a whole variety of messaging around a variety of protests that farmers were doing. And that's an obvious, explicit democratic government exerting its influence through single points of contact with, with huge user bases. They were very easy to do because they're web two and can be, can be pressured given shareholders, given jail potential for employees, et cetera. A more recent example is you know, Twitter blocking the post Hunter Biden story, which we now find out was actually real and they didn't allow any discussion of that. There's a whole number of COVID related elements too that now seem true that Twitter didn't allow discussion of as well. So whether that was explicit government discussion or just censorship from um, implied censorship is a little bit unclear, but the point is you've got these big platforms that people rely on that have vulnerabilities for, of censorship. But besides that, you also have the hosting element that happens, um, the hosting component of big tech. And when you have hosting dominated by a handful of large companies, you lead to, that leads to a, a whole number of pot potential issues regarding not just censorship, but also pricing and also innovation stifling. And so the top three um, hosting companies control about 60% of the cloud, and they're growing at 50% a year. And they're incredibly large, powerful businesses. And so why are they, they're driving the returns of these, these companies? And why is that the case? It's because they're hard to leave. And they perform a very good service when you're small. They give you a lot of technology to actually accelerate the development of your applications and your businesses early on but then you're unable to leave very easily afterwards. A couple companies have famously been able to extract themselves from these platforms, but only a couple, and when they've done it, it's been expensive and it's taken a lot of time. Um, an example is that Lyft alleged, this is a couple years old, but pays at least 14 cents a ride to AWS. Um, you also have an example of, of Parler. You know, let's leave politics aside for a second, but you've got a social media platform with 2 million users, deplatformed for a term of service violation. And no one here, I don't think, is going to, you know, die on Parler's kind of social good, right? But at the same time, you've got to realize that that, is, that provides real warning to other groups on that platform about how quickly 
they can be taken off with, a, with, with effectively arbitrarily. And that's what happens when you have private companies in control of this. They can pull the switch on you. And even if you haven't violated TOS, by the time you've fought that out, your business is seriously jeopardized if it's still alive. And resilience, and you make those, those trade-offs, if you have incredible resilience, you, that's maybe some, some reasonable, um, that might be a reasonable trade-off to some extent, but the larger these businesses get, the more complex they are, and the more um, the resilience has been threatened. And so we've seen Amazon Cloud go down, we've seen Facebook go down, we've seen WhatsApp go down, all of these businesses have suffered serious outages, and they, have gotten, they haven't gotten less as they've gotten this more, more infrequent as the businesses have scaled. They've gotten more frequent, and we don't expect this to stop. These are hard to run. They're complex businesses. There's a lot of – there's incredible um, – different single points of failure, multiple single points of failure given geographies and data centers involved. And human error comes into play regularly with almost all of these outages. And so you, besides having censorship, you have resilience issues, which we're supposed to be going in the other direction and being more resilient as technology advances. Um, and the question I think everyone here knows the answer to, but I'll ask it rhetorically, is this the internet we signed up for? And I don't think so. And Tim Berners-Lee did not have this in mind when he created, um, you know, basically the, the hyperlink and the easy access to information that we all take for granted now on the World Wide Web. But the issue is that internet economics rewards scale. And that was something not easily foreseen by everybody initially, but the scale that a global platform um, uh, can catalyze leads to ever increasing um, common oligopolist potential, where the larger you are, the more you can spend on advertising, the more you can spend on infrastructure, the more you can attract people, and that then allows you to outcompete the second biggest, and that kind of flywheel keeps going, and that's why you have, and why you've gotten to the place of the Amazons, and the Googles, and the Facebooks, and you know, um, you, na you name you know, the, um, the, the providers, the Microsofts, right? And so that continues, and they, because they're so large, they also, as I mentioned earlier, have to have relationships with governments. There's no large industry in the world that doesn't have a very close relationship with governments. Both need to. And so that also is not going to go away. It's only going to continue, and the question is only to how much. And so that is the real question. So how did we get here, and how do we evolve beyond this? Because governments are just sort of dipping their toes in this. They're extreme, potentially, in places like Russia and China. But the U.S., it's only going to increase, and we probably don't even know the level of actual involvement and relationship between these companies right now, and it probably is only going to continue. So we start off with mainframes and desktops, right? That was what Web, web 1.0. And then kicking and screaming, people were pulled into cloud computing. And I remember very well back, you know, I was looking at um, and was even investing in some of these cloud providers back in the 90s, and people were like, yeah, I'd rather host it internally. I'd rather have more control over my data. It's cheaper. It's more resilient. Well, fast forward now, all those reasons that people want to host internally are why they're at the cloud. But those exact reasons are why we think people are all going to move to peer-to-peer -peer platforms. Because peer-to-peer -peer will be more resilient, it'll be cheaper, and it'll be, less, um, it'll be censorship resistant. And so that's why we think open peer-to-peer -peer networks are the future. There are no centralized bottlenecks, there are no single points of failure, and there's much more censorship resistant. And that is really, I think, we'll go through each one of these um, at a time to show why we think each one of these is compelling. But first, peer-to-peer -peer can scale. Um, decentralized open architecture, you know, you allows the addition of limitless resources effectively on demand. And so it's sort of um, when pricing, when there's a shortage, uh, pricing goes up, resources are added. That's just sort of economics 101. And we can see the global community can respond far faster to a resource need than any particular company can. 
And that is what open peer-to-peer -peer networks take advantage of, is a global community and global availability of both hardware, which is sort of the obvious one in terms of network resources, but also in terms of software, which I'm gonna talk about as well. But the point is both of those can respond to um, demand needs much more quickly than any centralized business can. And also, it leads users that have different needs for different reliability to choose the level they'd like to pay for. And that's also kind of an important element that not every user needs the same level of reliability or wants to pay the same, the same pricing. Um, and in terms of security, you know, open peer-to-peer -peer networks are also um, far more censorship resistant because anyone can author or host an application. And if code is running on an open peer-to-peer -peer network, then you've got no legal entity to sanction, no, um, no board of directors to compel, no employees you can find to drag in or threaten with jail, and no shareholders to really pressure. And so when you have an open protocol that on, on a peer-to-peer -peer network on which an open decentralized application or a DAO is running, you really have a massive um, um, censorship or massive uh, uh, benefit of censorship resistance given the distributed nature of both the code, the hardware, and the actual human talent behind it. And you need all three of those things in order for things to work in a, um, in a way that will actually resist some of the obvious interference that we've seen. And then in terms of network resilience, you have applications that live in the network and they can be hosted in different geographies, by different providers, by different clouds. Um, they can move very easily and if any host would like to host an application, they can do so. Right now, this is, this is, there's great benefit to this. There's also risk to it, right? There are applications I'm sure none of us would like to see that could um, exist more easily in this type of a world. And so there is, it's, there's also risk with this, which we have to be aware of. And we don't have yet uh, obvious solutions for that, but that is something I just have to call out that it's not purely positive to have an open permissionless peer-to-peer -peer system because you can have things that we don't want. Right, and so this is a trade-off that we're all going to have to face. Um, and, and unfortunately, I don't have the answers for it. But I think that the, we've, we're shifting right now towards so much centralization and so much um, censorship that we probably err a little bit on the other. It's going to go the other way, hopefully, for a while, and we'll figure out kind of where where that middle middle place should be. Um, so, but peer-to-peer -peer platforms right now lack the compute layer. And so peer-to-peer -peer requires three things to be a fully functioning ecosystem. You need payments, you need storage, and you need compute, right? And so we know that two of those exist and are working um, very well, but the compute layer allows the off-chain scalable computation without which you're very limited in what you can do. And so let's talk about open peer-to-peer -peer traction. Everybody knows the traction of crypto, right? Crypto started all of this, payments. And whether it's Bitcoin, whether it's Ethereum, whether it's, you know, name your, 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 your coin of choice, that is working, it's functioning, it's global, that has been solved largely. Storage, thanks to IPFS and Filecoin, is also seems um, to be solved and only getting more and more solved based on the presentations that I just heard today, which is fabulous, right? You have um, um, recall is much faster, storage is only increasing dramatically, um, huge amount of storage on it, and I think that's only gonna increase. But compute has been a hole so far, and you need compute to have fully decentralized applications. And so let's look at where compute is now. You have smart contracts on chain, and that's compute, right? But you're limited, it's deterministic, right? And so you're constrained both by what you can compute and by cost as well, and by speed. And then you have decentralized hardware marketplaces, and that's fine, but those also are generally managed on chain, and that is about sort of more renting hardware, and it's not actually about offering the computation services. So it's sort of a layer below 
the actual clear compute that applications need. So what's missing? You want to eliminate entrance barriers, entrance barriers, and you want sort of function addressable storage and the ability to run full featured backends and basically also, if you want, be pluggable to blockchains if you want to have um, um, consensus as part of your compute. And so you basically need to have general purpose peer-to-peer -peer compute. And that's what Fluence is working on. And it's any computation it should be is supported, and it's function addressable, permissionless, um, with a universal runtime. And so that's what we're building. And whether it's us that are successful with it or others, we think that is a critical component of making Web3 a fully functional um, and featured solution. Um, you know, we talk about where else this can be used. You know, one element here is deplatforming, and I kind of referenced it earlier, but you need to have this ability of computation distributed in order to avoid deplatforming. And we've seen that happen in the Web2 space, right? You see Twitter kill off a bunch of features. You've seen Facebook deplatform. I'm, I'm dating myself, obviously, but Farmville <laughs> way back when. Um, and so you've seen deplatforming happen both from an application level, you've seen it a parlor on a, on a company sort of level, you've seen deplatforming happen across the space, and the idea is to create an architecture that prevents deplatforming. Um, and that is what we're focusing on. The area people haven't focused on so much is deplatforming still is a risk, even in Web3. And that's because there's still centralized developer APIs with a lot of the Web3 businesses and Web3 applications that we know very well. And no, this hasn't happened yet. We've run some risks of it. But this is still an issue. You also have centralized backends for very um, well-known and important Web3 businesses. right? And so this is not a critique of these businesses. There aren't real alternatives right now. That's what we are trying to provide, others are trying to provide, because you, to be fully functional Web3, you can't rely on centralized developer APIs. You can't have centralized backends just to serve a decentralized user interface, right? So you have to get a step deeper and have this compute layer fully functional and, and, um, and, and live. And so, how do we build these best peer-to-peer -peer applications? And this, in this community, I think people will appreciate it, but it doesn't have to be blockchain-based. Right? People here understand that storage is not all on-chain. Right? The incentives are on-chain, and the verifications are on-chain, but the storage doesn't have to be. And so compute also doesn't have to be on-chain. And if it is on-chain, you run into a variety of constraints. And so also, let's not forget, the current hugely successful cloud businesses, their compute is not on-chain. And they're doing just fine with a huge number and of, of very important, significant customers um, who pay them a lot of money. And so I like, we like to look at it this way, where you have centralized computing and on-chain computing. And in the middle is where um, where fluence exists and where we think peer-to-peer -peer computing exists, where you have no middlemen, you don't have the redundancy you do of, um, of blockchain-based computing, but it is verifiable, you can plug in consensus, and you can anchor on chain, it's far cheaper and far faster than on-chain computing, and it's not deterministic. And so I think in this group, I probably have to spend less time on that, given your familiarity with IPFS and Filecoin and how the storage and verification works. But it is important that people sometimes equate peer-to-peer -peer with on-chain. And you know, all I have to do is go back to the Napster days to realize right, that's not, that doesn't have to be the case and, and, and start it off, frankly, not being the case. Um, so what is Fluence? It's a peer-to-peer -peer application platform. And so it's a computing network of nodes. It is a l programming language that is the first programming language for native peer-to-peer -peer application composition. And then that allows basically a code creator economy I'll talk about because I think that, that kind of is, it gets to some of the resilience I was referencing earlier. Um, but what this application language does, which is called Aqua, it basically allows functions to um, exist and, to, and to, to run without central coordination. 
And so you can create a function that looks up the next, um, uh, uh, basically looks up the location for the computation to be performed, completes it, and then looks up the next um, next peer to perform the computation, and then l continues. And it's very different than the client server or you know the the, um, um, the client server type of of computation. And that is a terrific innovation. And the basically the application construction in Aqua allows you to create these app, the, um, the, um, the applications in much, much faster than if you were to try to, for example, use Rust, um, which we think is kind of the closest, the closest peer to it. Um, it's based on PyCalculus, um, and it basically views applications as network protocols. And I'm gonna skip through some of this because we're running a little bit out of time, but you can see what's available now, which is peer discovery, um, you know, obviously there's DHT, which is an important part of this, it, as critical in any functioning kind of network, um, file management, data stream, et cetera, and a, a whole number of things are on our roadmap to come out later this year. Um, but effectively, you run, peer-to-peer -peer computing network runs Aqua, which allows you to have high throughput, permissionless, and effectively unstoppable. But there's no global consensus, and that's a positive. Um, because it doesn't, you're not burdened with the consensus overhead. Um, and he, this is, I want to spend, this is, I think, really important. So if you think about how software and code has been developed so far, you have, look at this as version one, version 1.1, version 1.2. And the author or company creates version 1.0, it discontinues it, you move to version 1.2, it discontinues it, and then you can see all the hosts are hosting version 1.2. We're kind of comfortable, and that's what normally happens. But if you're running a peer-to-peer -peer network, and on the flu and the Fluence architecture allows this, you basically, when an author puts version one out there, it's out there. And as long as a host has a customer that wants to pay for that version one code, it's there. If the author wants to change it, he can't. It's already out there, right? The author can post version 1.1, Host can host that, author can create version 1.2, host can host that, but there is no, there, you're, you're, you're pulled out of, as, as, a, as a developer, you're pulled out of that upgrade cycle and your dependencies are safe because you're not compelled to continually upgrade, unsure of what might break or what other changes you might have to make. And so this basically releases code and allows it to exist for based on the market as long as people want to do it. It also prevents disgruntled developers from inserting malicious code into stuff into into existing kind of um, applications, which we've seen happen as well. Um, and so. What that basically, and, and just to go back on this, the way we've architected this is code is, is, is um, hosted. The host shares a small amount of that revenue with the author. And so some developer using the code will pay a hosting fee just like you do on any other you know, platform, Amazon or whoever, but some piece of that via smart contract goes to the original author. And so it's actually an ecosystem, this is the code creator economy concept, that actually will allow open source developers to issue code, have it work, and actually have some revenue associated for that for as long as that code continues to be served. And so I kind of mentioned this, that um, you know, nodes are, that basically you're sort of no longer out of, you're out of that upgrade cycle as a user, and as a developer, you benefit from um, anyone using it. Um, and so where are we right now? We've launched um, the Aqua and the peer-to-peer -peer network. It's live, you can, look at, you, can, um, you can look at it currently. We're working on um, launching a DAO that will happen this year to govern our network. And then the compute economy, which is effectively that smart contract-based relationship between um, the code that is created and the host that hosts it, that is the element that we're working on next and should be out later this year as well. So, um, you know, find us um, here at our developer hub, dash.fluence.dev. Um, and, you know, I guess what I, and I'd also say that here's some other elements, the fluence, fluence.network, our Discord as well. Um, you know, and I guess I just say, you know, this is sort of rhetorical for everybody here, but I don't think any of us want three companies controlling internet hosting. And I don't think we want our content monitored by nation states, right? And so right now there are really high barriers to building independently, not 
on these three companies. And Fluence is trying to build a world and a network and environment that makes it easier and simpler, and we hope even better, to, um, to, to create and build outside of all of these ecosystems. And in an ecosystem governed by and, um, and, re and that rewards the whole developer community globally. And that is, that is our vision. And so I just say here to support Web3, host, contribute, follow. And you know, we're, we're super excited to be um, working as closely with um, IPFS and Filecoin as we can to help enable that world that I think we all believe in. And so with that, I thank you for your time and attention and happy to take a few questions. Do we, we question or do I go over to my, any, or, or no questions? Yes. Um, so it's that we're working on that right now. So we have nodes up at currently. And so they're, they phrase it this way. Um, it's going to be more about reliability than power. And right. So it's not like Bitcoin. It's not like mining. It's more about the computation level you want to provide. And then your cost of providing that versus the cost of other people providing it. So I think it's going to be more about what people will value. I think is going to be more about reliability than raw computation power. We don't think of Fluence as being ideal for like sequencing a genome or something like that. It's not about raw power, but it is about, we think people will care more about reliability. So bandwidth uptime, you know, network uptime, et cetera. And I think that's gonna be more of a focus than, than raw power. Anything else? Okay. Thank you guys. Oh, oh, yep. Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. I mean, listen, and the answer is no, but machine learning is like saying that we're like, yeah, like there's so many different kinds, so I don't know. And, and the other point I should mention is also we've seen people want to run Fluence nodes internally on their own systems as well. So they, we, right now what, what people are doing on Fluence is actually using their own hardware to run applications and to develop on top of it. And so I think that we could see that happen internally I don't know whether you will use it to have. So from that side, yes. I don't think it's. you will see people say, let me get six different hosts around the world and together kind of run a machine learning application. I doubt that. But will someone either do it in-house, maybe, or will someone find one host that has sufficient kind of um, both bandwidth and computation to do it? Possibly. Um, but it's, it's not a let's find, you know, spare laptop capacity around the world and pull it all together. We don't, we don't think that's a realistic use. Um, and we've got breakfast tomorrow at 9 if anybody wants to meet more of the team um, and our decentralized summit tomorrow at the Vox Hotel. So we're on the main... You know? oh. oh, sorry, Metropolitan, my bad. But we should just look at the, the, um, the general schedule and we're on it. All right, for DevConnect. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.